All right, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's just after 2.30 p.m., so we'll get started. Um, welcome to the February COVID Info Commons Research Webinar. My name is Lauren Close, and I'm the Operations and Communications Manager for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University. I'm also a leading member of the COVID Info Commons project team. The COVID Info Commons, or KIC, is a COVID research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. Every month, the KIC brings together scholars from all over the country to share their research findings in the form of lightning talks. Each scholar today will engage the community directly, answering questions about their work during a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. But before I hand you over to today's fantastic group of speakers, I'd like to first introduce you to the rest of the KIC project team. Today, we're joined by the Hubs Executive Director, Florence Hudson, Haley Stewart, who is a student uh, employee of the Hub, who will be writing a summary of um, the, today's discussion for later distribution. And most notably, I want to also welcome Kenya Pujols, who is our new um, KIC program manager. Kenya joined us um, just this Monday and has already made some really serious headway on future projects and programming. So Kenya, we're so glad that you're here. Um, and now I want to uh, also open up the floor to Florence, who will say a bit more about the KIC, and I will follow up with some information and announcements about the COVID Info Commons Extension Award. Excellent. So Florence, take it away. Thank you so much, Lauren. So thank you everyone for joining us, and especially thank you to our panelists and to Kenya for joining the team. Uh, Kenya just joined us as part of the COVID Info Commons Extension Award. She'll be the KIC program manager. She is leading our project, our project management office, which is really great. So um, the COVID Information Commons actually began in 2020, uh, similar to when we all became aware of COVID-19 and had to deal with it. So when we created the COVID Information Commons, it was requested that we create a single portal so that all the NSF awards related to COVID could be found easily. At the time, there were rapid awards being given out, rapid response awards. When they initially contacted us in March of 2020, um, we looked it up and there were only 32 awards at the time <laughs> that were COVID rapids. Now there are many. Uh, so we, uh, they asked us to create this portal, which we did, which quickly became a community. We kicked it off in July of 2020 and we had about 170 people that joined the event, which really surprised us. What was also surprising and wonderful is that we had 42 PIs that had NSF COVID awards asked to present their research, which was great. So we immediately said, well, welcome to the COVID Info Commons portal and community. <laughs> we will have these webinars until you're all done presenting and that hasn't happened. And there are more awards being given out. So um, we actually have a few different features um, as Lauren is showing, thank you. Um, we currently have the NSF COVID awards and PI database. Um, when we, about a year ago, we had about 990 awards to the end of last year. Now with our COVID Info Commons extension, we actually update the corpus every month and now there are 1,770 awards, all NSF at this point. We invite NSF and NIH speakers, PIs to present on these webinars. And our plan is to add the NIH COVID awards to the corpus in second quarter of this year. And that's part of the extension program that we have going on. There's also a machine learning maps tool. You can see the blue bar in the middle, click for COVID research, explore ML maps, um, which is a machine learning based clustering technology that clusters the awards. So you can see them by category. And there's a lot of information that all the PI uh, videos are in there and meet the researchers. Um, we're gonna be announcing a new COVID Info Commons student paper challenge in a couple of months. Um, we had one this past year, and this is really a community for all of you to collaborate as we combat COVID-19 um, in 2022 still, and then look to the future. So we're very grateful for the funding from the NSF Convergence Accelerator Program, um, who funded the initial rapid award and the extension that we received in October. And as Lauren mentioned, we at the Northeast Hub have been leading this effort, but we work collaboratively with the other three NSF Big Data Innovation Hubs in the Midwest, the South, and the West. So thank you so much, Lauren. 
Uh, thank you, Florence. And I wanted to um, take an, a moment to just expand on some of the things that you touched on just now, specifically about the COVID extension award that we received in October. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're very excited about this new initiative and wanted to talk about it quite briefly before we head over to the speaker presentations. So as of October last year, the KIC received an additional $2 million in funding from the NSF to support our new COVID information commons extension for pandemic recovery program. And as Florence noted, the KIC was initially established in May of 2020 to facilitate information sharing, collaboration across NSF funded COVID research efforts. <clears throat> and by extending the KIC effort to include these pandemic recovery phases, <clears throat> Excuse me. I can take over um, if you need me to. We've both been going through coughing. Just let me know. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is. Just a small cold. Um, by, but in any sense, um, what I was going to say is by extending the kick effort to include this pandemic recovery phase, the extension will reach an even greater audience. That's our hope um, to reach a more diverse community of COVID researchers. And this would potentially include NIH or CDC researchers, um, including those that are funded through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. So I've included in this slide just some information about the various tasks and projects that we're working on as part of the KIC E award. Um, some items to note in particular um, are that we've increased the number of awards in our new database. Um, this has just been updated today to 1,770, which is really exciting. It's a big jump from where we were earlier this year. Um, additionally, we're developing new resources to encourage COVID PIs um, to find new collaboration opportunities across disciplines. And that's obviously a key function of our webinar event today for example. Um, and as Florence noted, we're creating new student challenges, programs, and opportunities to really bolster that next generation of scientists and grow their interest in COVID health research and, and in data science. So regarding those awards that we mentioned, um, we brought onto our team this year, um, who's also here in the webinar with us today, Ryan Shirley, um, who is our lead technical developer. Ryan and our support team at Columbia have made really fantastic progress in the Kiki since even October. Um, so we now can um, offer um, the database to the public for, for just under 1800 award records. You can use our database to search NSF awards related specifically to the coronavirus, but in the coming months, we'll be adding awards on related adjacent topics, which may include pandemics broadly, um, zoonoses, disaster management, et cetera. Um, and in the second quarter of this year, we're gonna add additional NIH research awards also related to the coronavirus virus. And again, we're just trying to expand this database to be as um, useful as possible to the community. Um, so we'll be pulling in feedback from PIs whose work is featured in our KIC database. So please keep an eye out for those details. Um, we'll be doing a survey on how we can best help you find this crucial information. Um, so in the coming months, we'll also be expanding the KICS digital events offerings. We've received some feedback from the community already about what opportunities and resources you'd like to see offered through the KIC. Um, we're hearing that you would like us to offer more networking, um, collaboration opportunities. So we'll be facilitating those and uh, stay tuned. And excitingly, I also want to briefly mention that we're working closely with Columbia University Libraries on an accessibility initiative for the KIC. This will allow us to make the content of webinars like this one accessible to a broader audience. And so with the help of our students and our volunteers, we're in the process of transcribing our monthly webinars so that individuals with accessibility needs can read about this research rather than just listen to it or watch the live stream. Um, we're also beginning to translate those texts into Spanish and reach an even wider part of our community. In the coming months, we may also add American Sign Language overlays to those videos. And the goal overall is to make this um, space that we've already created um, open to an even greater public audience. Um, and so before I uh, hand over um, the presentations today to the speakers, I wanna ask Florence, is there anything else we should you know, uh, promote or, or say about this really exciting kick extension. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for creating such a comprehensive list of things. So yeah, there are a couple of other things. One is that we do these monthly webinars. Um, they've been multidisciplinary to help us hear each other and see each other's thinking so we can work more collaboratively across different areas to bring um, 
better answers and newer answers uh, to the forefront. The other thing we're looking at is creating some thematic events. And Kenya, as our new KIC program manager, actually in her interview process, she even brought this up. And so we discussed it with NSF yesterday in our monthly call with them. And they really like the idea of, you know, let's give it a try, like if we have a, a special theme. So if any of you have ideas, um, on like one of these kick webinars uh, that we could do maybe in April or May. If there is a thematic area you would like us to focus on, either have like some type of presenter we bring in, um, or it's, you know, the PIs in, in, in that area that could be presenting their research. Um, let us know if there are any areas like that that, have interest, that are of interest to you. Some of the things we've heard from PIs who presented before included um, vaccines from many different perspectives, vaccine hesitancy, um, you know, social and behavioral implications of COVID and other things. So um, there are different areas we could go into as well as, you know, zoonotics as compared as an example. So, you know, if there are areas like that, that you would like to, to be one of the presenters, um, or you think would be a good thematic discussion area, we can have presenters. And then like we do in these kick webinars every month, spend, you know, like, you know, a third to a half of the time actually having the discussion around it and seeing where we can go forward together. The other thing, uh, two things I wanted to mention briefly, which are on the list that Lauren had, was that as part of our kick extension, we're going to be creating a new metadata and data search and discovery mechanism. If when you go into the kick database now, in that area Lauren was highlighting with the the award search, if you put in a keyword, it goes against the corpus of the awards in the database. What we would like is that when you put your keyword in there or on the homepage or something Ryan is organizing for us, our technical leader, um, is that you could actually go beyond the corpus of NSF awards. It will include the NIH awards by the end of June is our plan, but also more broadly, when you look at the COVID info commons, you could see at the top here where it says opportunities and resources. When you go into there, there are data sets, groups, and guides that we vet to make sure it looks like it's you know legitimate information, <clears throat> but we would like to be able to crawl more of that and find information pertinent to you, as well as through the PI surveys where we ask them for additional information about their awards, we actually link to websites with the results of their research. So what we wanna do is create a more comprehensive metadata and data search and discovery mechanism. <clears throat> We're gonna be working with some of the Open Knowledge Network, OKN, um, projects in this area. Some of you may have gone to the NIH ODSS, <laughs> for those of us who love acronyms, uh, discussion last week, where the National Institutes of Health on um, the Office of Data Science uh, Strategy was talking about some of their new initiatives. So there's a lot of collaboration we can do in this space to bring the content you need to you. So that's an important thing. And then the other thing is that um, we're planning on doing an annual conference as part of the ongoing uh, COVID Info Commons plan. Um, and we're thinking that we would integrate the student paper challenge with that. So if you have any thoughts on that, um, we were hoping to do it in person with the sine wave affiliated with COVID. Um, we're thinking that's not a great idea. <laughs> so we're probably gonna do virtual. We may try something hybrid, but that'll be planned for later this year. So as we work through the four years that we're very grateful NSF has asked us to continue this effort, we wanna to bring to you what's most important to you and for this effort. So feel free to engage with us. Um, you can put it in the chat. Um, I think um, Lauren has on a lot of the, uh, the slides, we have info at covidinfocommons.net. That's our email address. Go to the KIC website, put it in there. There are a lot of ways to find us, but we wanna keep on working with you and we wanna hear what you want. So please continue to tell us. Thank you very much, Lauren. Yeah, thank you, Florence. So let me um, transition to um, an introduction to our speakers for today's um, event, we'll be hearing from three fantastic researchers who will cover various topics related to COVID-19. Um, so we have with us um, France Belanger from uh, Virginia Tech, Hu Zhong Li at Yale, and both uh, Stephen Skiena and Jin Ju Wo at Stony Brook University. So we'll Hello, everyone. My name is Hu Jun Li from Yale School of Medicine, and I am going to talk about the intractome landscape of SARS-CoV-2 virus human protein protein interactions by machine learning. So there are two objectives I need to look at. The first is to develop the protein sequence-based multi-class machine learning or deep learning classifiers for evidence or confidence level prediction using the viruses during database. The second is to and using those classifiers, we want to create a draft interactive landscape of SARS-CoV-2 virus-human protein-protein interactions. 
So here is an overview of our machine learning and deep learning workflow. So we use the virus screen database, which does not include SARS-CoV-2 at the time of analysis. This is the uh, network of PPI, virus human PPIs, which contain more than 80,000 uh, interactions between about 1,200 virus proteins from 102 virus species and about 8,500 human proteins. And each interaction has a combined scores from ranging from zero to 1,000, which we convert into five evidence classes, pieces. And this is the distribution of number of PPIs for evidence classes. And we are going to focus on the experimental PPIs, which belong to evidence class three or two uh, based on zero index here. And based on the data, uh, we first extract node features, you know, the protein features, which are fractional compositions of 20 amino acids. And at this point, uh, we are developing two different uh, models, uh, which one is more canonical machine learning models, like random force and axial force in this case. And another one is based on deep learning. We specifically use graph neural networks, so graph sage or uh, generalized, generalized version of graph sage or kin sage. For canonical machine learning, we also extract edge features, which are 72 distance or similarity measures between amino acid composition profiles between virus proteins and human proteins. And based on the features, we develop the random forest and edge boost. For random forest, uh, we optimized uh, 36 models by grid search with temporal class variation and 432 models for execute case with uh, the same temporal class variation. And in short, we obtain up to 67% AUC and 37% accuracy for random forest case and 74% AUC and 67% accuracy for execute boost case. And this work, this part has been uh, published as a preprint uh, recently. So you can refer to uh, the paper in detail. And for graph sage, uh, we're still in manuscript in preparation, but I'm going to show you briefly show you uh, the results of, from graph sage as well, because this shows more than 70% accuracy, which is uh, apparently promising as well. And here I'm going to just show you a performance example for the best models for 20% validation set with this random seed. Uh, we see when in this case, when the forest shows 60% accuracy, as it was 67.7% accuracy. And if you look at computer metrics, again, I'm going to focus on this EC3, which implies mostly uh, experimental PPIs. And if we look at the individual classes, uh, focusing on F1 score, the actual boost shows higher F1 scores across all ind individual classes. Based on based on this the perform, better performing XP boost model, the important features were identified using two alternative methods here, one by gene index and the other by SHEP analysis, which is based on SHEP uh, game theoretic SHEP values. And interesting enough, we see that cysteine and histine are most two most important features. Or this minus means that the fraction of system between virus and human, and the ratio means the ratio between the fractions, system and histone fractions between virus and humans. One control experiment we performed is to compare prediction of experimental PPIs and with a prediction of text mining PPIs in the virus stream data. Because the data size the difference is uh, pretty big here, six for difference. But what we observe here is that actually boost in fact uh, shows higher accuracy with 94% accuracy compared to 90% accuracy uh, for text mining case. So despite the data size difference, uh, actually boost uh, shows a good prediction performance. And this is the agreement between random force and actually boost for UC3 and text mining as we expect, shows mostly EC1 or EC2. 
So based on those encouraging results, we applied uh, those classifiers to SARS-CoV-2 uh, for our second objective in two ways. So first we apply that to intact data base, which are a collection of experimental PPIs. And here I'm showing you the network by XGBoost with XGBoost predictive evidence. So EC3 for blues, EC4 red. So this can be viewed as prioritizing a network. So although these links, or the about 2000 links from experimental data are equally meaningful, we can also prioritize those links based on this evidence class predicted by XGBoost in this case. Uh, secondly, we also apply that to protein-wide interaction that pairwise the old pairs of more than half a million uh, between 27 SARS-CoV-14 and uh, about more than 20,000 human proteins. And here I'm showing you the subset of 22,000 PPIs with evidence class at least true. I either actually was uh, the best exodus or random first uh, star. And this is the another subset, 140 PPIs with the highest evidence class five by XV, XV star. And based on this interaction network, we observed that many human proteins are enriched in vascular smooth muscle contraction and the targets and also distant to a components. There are a few more applications of this work that have been found in the past month, actually. So Giuseppe Novelli, so who is a renowned geneticist in Rome, in Italy, uh, it reached out to me by email, actually by surprise, last month after reading my preprint, telling me about his COVID therapeutics his publication of HECT3 E3 ligases. And uh, his idea of using uh, the results from this important work to his ongoing research. And we uh, immediately realized that we can help each other uh, based on my results on interactome network results. And we found that hack domain protein in fact attempt to interact with size with the proteins with evidence class at least two with statistical significance. In other words, hack domain proteins are favored by size with two. Based on that observation, you're also asking whether there are other protein families favored by SARS-CoV-2. In addition, we can also extend that to other virus species like human metanema virus, which uh, Dr. Novelli is also working on as well. So finally, I'm going to show you briefly about the graph neural networks uh, using graph sage and sage uh, architecture. On the left are the accuracies by 15 different models using three different drop rates in the columns and five different edge embedding methods. As you see, without dropout rates, in fact, we see more than 70% accuracy values and accuracies, so which are very promising. This is again based on private screen. And if we apply that to SARS-CoV-2 in the data case, we see the prediction is enriched with evidence class two or three, in fact, which are mostly expanded PPIs. So, and this consensus is number of agreements among these 15 different models. We see more consensus of like uh, eight to nine for agents two compared to six to seven for agents one. But I think this is also very encouraging results. We will see. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators for very helpful discussions and feedback and support and there's a center for research computing for computational resources and public health community that deals from engineering and applied science and finally do this with a family and proxy fund to support this work. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Hojun. And um, I've just dropped into the chat for everyone to look at some links that are relevant to this presentation. So I want to thank you for sharing those with us. And as a, another reminder to our audience, uh, either hang on to those questions for each of our speakers or drop them into the chat for our moderated Q&A session at the end of the next presentation. And so with that, I will welcome and, and introduce you to our next uh, speaker, um, Jingji Guo, who's here with Stephen Scanna from uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Let me share my screen. Now see the slides. Yes. Yes, they look good. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, thanks for uh, having us here. Uh, my name is Xinzhi. I'm a fourth year PhD student working with Professor Steve Skinner at Stony Brook University. And Professor Skinner is also the director of the uh, Stony Brook AI Institute. And this presentation is about uh, how knowledge graph embedding changes during COVID as our world changes. And the main content is based on a recent paper published at KDD 2021 collaborating with Bao Jian uh, when he was supposed to start here. Okay. So let's go next. So first thing first, what is the graph embedding or others may call it a network embedding or node embeddings. So basically it's a function that maps a node in the graph to a numerical vector, which we call it a, a embedding vector. So as the following uh, tall example shows, we could map every node uh, in this graph to this 2D space. So the embedding could capture the meaning of the node in the original graph by the fact that uh, the closer nodes in the graph may have similar vectors in the embedding space. So in this example, uh, you can see the nodes with the same color also get together uh, to each other on this 2D plane. And uh, most importantly, by this low dimension numerical embedding vector, uh, we could apply existing machine learning algorithms for many downstream tasks, for example, the node classification, uh, node clustering for the community discovery or the outlier uh, detection. And uh, however, this example is a static graph where uh, there's no new edge, no new node, everything is fixed. But in our real life, our world is always changing. So do the real world graphs and the nodes. Okay. Next. Okay, so let's take a look at the real world changing graph, or we can call it a dynamic graph. So now in Wikipedia link knowledge graph, each node is a wiki articles, usually describing uh, the real world entities. And each edge is the hyperlink connecting two articles, kind of like the citation uh, we do when we write in a paper. So this graph is, is large scale, have millions of nodes, and hundreds of millions of edges, and it keeps scaling up, as you can see in this little figure. And certainly, some entities may change many and being captured by this dynamic knowledge graph. And I want to show one specific example of uh, the city of Wuhan. Okay. So uh, before COVID, Wuhan is probably less famous to the people around the world. And at the end of uh, 2019 and early 2020, I think most people knew it as the first place of a COVID outbreak. And I think, so I think this is a good example of the changing or the, or the changed entity. So here the uh, figure shows a Wikipedia article of Wuhan and I highlight the hyperlinks it has. And the first two paragraphs are the geo or some historical events related to Wuhan. But in 2019, suddenly uh, we see many COVID related new links were created. So, Back to the graph embedding perspective, the question is how to uh, efficiently track those node embeddings in this dynamic massive graph so that we can detect the embedding movement of a node and uh, compare it across time so we can see how this changes. Okay, next. So this question motivates us to design a new algorithm that can handle uh, the problem uh, that we call a subset node embedding in dynamic large graphs. So using this algorithm, we can track the embeddings of several predefined nodes. So it's a subset of nodes instead of the uh, four nodes in the graph that we are interested in uh, as the graph keeps evolving. So the key idea is to use personalized PageRank, uh, which is very successful algorithm used by Google search. 
And one advantage over other method is that uh, we could compute only what we need for the subset nodes of uh, for the subset nodes. While most other algorithms have to compute all embeddings of every node across every time, but they finally use only part of them. So the rest of them are just wasted. So our algorithm is more efficient and faster. It's very suitable for this problem. But for more details, please refer uh, to our paper, which are listed here. And as this example illustrates the concept, uh, our method can calculate the embeddings of a specific node in this case, uh, Wuhan across different year, and we can expect a huge embedding movement from 2019 to 2020. Okay, so next. So let's see the uh, experiment result. First, we collect the English Wikipedia graph snapshot every day in 2020. And as I mentioned before, it's a very large dynamic graph. We can see in this table, roughly uh, we got 30K new edges inserted every day. And we released the data in this GitHub repository, so it's very easy to access. And we keep track of Wuhan together with other hundreds of Chinese cities. And this figure shows uh, how the changes we detected in the embedding space. So as you can see, the curve of Wuhan is prominent. They have a huge peak. And we highlight several peaks with annotation and found that uh, they are all correlated, with, uh, correlated to the timeline of COVID. And there's another peak, and you can see uh, we spot one other peak in the city of Chengdu, uh, which reflects the US-China diplomatic tension when US decided to close its consulate in Chengdu. So it has the uh, serendipity we discovered in this study. Okay, so, oops. So uh, we have another experiment where we want to see the most changed cities in different time periods. So we ranked the embedding movements of the tracked node at each time and found that uh, you can see this Wuhan usually uh, is usually the top changed one among others as COVID uh, evolves. And we highlight the uh, news title in that uh, time period so we can uh, have an idea of what happened in that place. So, okay, so the major takeaways are uh, we have a very efficient node embedding algorithm that can capture the embeddings in very large dynamic graphs. Then we investigated the evolution of Wikipedia knowledge graph in 2020 and found the interesting node changes during COVID. And for more detail, please refer to our paper and uh, see the released resources. And yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yingxi. Um, very interesting insights from you and Professor Skiana, and I'm sure we'll uh, parse through more of these details in the Q&A session to, uh, to follow. And before we get to the q and I'm going to I'm going to jump back in and share my screen for a second. Okay, um, I want to just end this session by thanking um, each of you, all of our researchers who've shared their work with us today. Um, each of your presentations provides really great insights and I'm excited to hear more of the conversation around it. For the audience, let me say that each of these presentations is currently available on our website, um, which is covidinfocommons.net. Um, as we noted earlier today, these presentations will be given additional accessibility features, including English and Spanish transcripts, so keep an eye out for those. And before we segue into the Q&A session, I want to um, provide you with these uh, details about ways that you can continue to stay in touch with the COVID Info Commons and the NABD Hub. So, um, you know, you can check out our, our website. We have a newsletter. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Slack, and LinkedIn. Um, if you have any questions about our events, you can always email email us. Um, we're always happy to hear from you. I will drop the details of this slide um, directly into the chat. So go ahead and peruse all of these at your own pace. We love hearing from you, our community. So please do reach out. Um, and in the coming weeks, we'll be announcing the date and speaker lineup for our next webinar, which will be in early March. So keep an eye on that. Um, and finally, I'll mention that when we close out the Zoom webinar today, you'll receive a little pop-up from Zoom asking you to participate in a survey about the event. So please consider giving us your feedback. We, we're listening. We want to hear your insights. Um, so again, I'll, I'll drop all these details into the chat. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Florence and Kenya, who will be kicking off our Q&A conversation this afternoon. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. And I always learn so much and I have so many new questions every time I hear um, this, this research. So um, the first question that uh, Miranda Lynch actually put into the chat was, great work, Hojun. How were the five evidence classes determined? The evidence classes seem highly imbalanced in terms of numbers in each class. What impact does this have on the learning results? Any comments on that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Miranda. That's an important question. So at this point in this work, uh, we simply uh, defined the five classes based on beating, uh, the, the, being the scores from zero to 1,000 to five equal sized beans of 200. So that's why you see the imbalance there. But, and it is possible that the learning results might change mm -hmm. depending on how the classes are defined. We did not quite uh, examine uh, very details about how to the, define the different uh, the classes, different ways, but that is uh, apparently uh, something we need to look into in, in very detail. And, but having said that, we instead try to control uh, that imbalance uh, by examining the experimental PPIs, which belong to mostly EC3, evidence class three, uh, with much less uh, number of the data points compared to like text mining, like I, as I showed, uh, more than six four difference. So that that was kind of one control experiment we, we tried to address that. Thank you. Very interesting. I have kind of a follow up question on your on your research, uh, Hojun. And I want to mention that Ho Jun Lee, as well as uh, Professor uh, Skiana and uh, Jing Ji from Stony Brook, are seed fund awardees from the Northeast Big Data Hub. So they're kind of funded through the hub from NSF. Um, and so, you know, as I was looking at all your great work, um, Ho Jun, I was thinking about are there any learnings you want to share regarding? The different machine learning techniques that you used about what type of insights you get and if there are some that are better um, in some of these COVID related questions or another another perspective. One of the things we try to do is we're working with some of the students. We have another program called our National Student Data Core is to try to give them a feel for how they think through what tools and techniques to use when they're looking to address a problem leveraging data science. Are there any insights like that that you've gleaned yet or that you expect to glean? Well, uh, it, it is, you know, it, it's a vast field and everybody is actually working on it. And Apprentice Junji has very good uh, work there as well as presented. And from my perspective, it is apparently very exciting. And every time you see in any direction, you can find something to work on and mm -hmm. apply any tool available around. But um, I think ironically, <laughs> My comment would be all mothers wrong and some are useful. That, that would be my, uh, my basic advice before starting something or work on machine learning or deep learning, uh, because that's something I always learn at the end of the, any project. I always work on deep, uh, deep uh, the drug repurposing, for example, work with uh, Price and Taimani, for example, with Mark Gerstein. Uh, but I think or, always we, we kind of uh, face that kind of barrier. And that, in fact, uh, makes us uh, think deeper and dig deeper. And I think that's uh, really important to understand. So practically speaking, I think it is actually easy to you know, get some tools and apply to any, anything uh, interesting uh, if you're in interest. So, that's a great answer. That'll make it easier for the students. Just jump in, right? <laughs> yes, that is, that is the best, I think, uh, thing to practically speak. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's really cool. Um, did you have something you wanted to add to that, uh, Zhengzhi, based on uh, your research regarding the different tools and techniques that you're using? Yeah, uh, I think I agree. I agree the quote. Yeah, all the model are wrong, but still useful. And from my perspective, nowadays there are like deep learning things. Actually, if the network goes deeper, it's really it's harder to understand what is happening. But it's definitely very useful in terms of the performance. So uh, I'm also struggling at this point. Either we go to more interpretable, but with mm. lower accuracy or more interpretable, but probably the performance does not goes up. So yeah, that's the things I'm struggling with. Thanks. Very interesting. 
Um, and then Kenya, our new KIC program manager has a question to ask actually. Uh, yes, I do. So this question is for, for Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. And um, I was really curious about when you were talking about the applications of your work, something that we are probably all hoping to, to have in the future, maybe some cure, where, whether or not that's possible, or some drugs that can aim with the symptoms. So, um, for example, uh, the human, um, uh, the virus of human, human of immunodeficiency virus um, already has some drugs that target their proteins and inhibits their spikes. So I was wondering if you can share a little bit more about what might be preventing um, more development on drugs in regards to the coronavirus, like what is special about their molecular uh, features that maybe is, is not helping the, the scientific community to come up with uh, drugs at this moment. And the second question is, what are the next steps to further advance your research about COVID uh, PPIs and its, and its applications? Thank you. Thank you, Kenya. Yeah, those are also very important questions. Uh, let me just answer the second question first, because we uh, I already uh, showed a couple of uh, applications. For example, the, the work with uh, Dr. Uh, Giuseppe Novelli, uh, from uh, Italy. So I think there's a clear application based on uh, this PPI network. And it was very clear, which I did not expect until mm. I heard uh, from him uh, by surprise. So that's one application there. And it's not just about SARS-CoV-2. Uh, also, we also looking at the you know, human methanium virus as well. So any virus can be a uh, target uh, in that sense. The first question is really, really tough question, which I cannot answer based on my current work. Um, hopefully, I mean, one answer really we like to have is the uh, feature importance is uh, actually related to this uh, the model interpretation as well. And although we see cysteine and histidine are important features based on two, uh, two different the methods, but we are not yet sure uh, exactly molecularly how that can be interpreted as well. And we have, as I mentioned, uh, we also working on uh, drug repurposing, actually the work with Prash and Emani and Mary Bristein. That might be uh, one way to answer your first question. Hopefully we are still working on that. So let me just stop there. Thank you. Excellent question, Kenya, and great way to jump into the COVID Info Commons community as our new program manager running our program management office. And I just want to mention, I know Miranda, if you're someplace you can talk, but um, I just want to mention what Miranda put into the chat. Miranda Lynch, she's been on many of our kick webinars, we're very lucky. <laughs> she's an avid partner. In I'm the a community. fan. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you want to uh, talk, uh, just mention what you said about um, how this is a new landscape that could be exploited in new SARS-CoV-2 therapeutics. I think that's an interesting comment you make. Thank you. And, and that actually was such a great question. I wanted to kind of follow up on it from, from Kenya. Um, the, the whole idea of actually targeting interactions um, is, is quite new and is starting to get traction in fields such as uh, cancer therapeutics. And so uh, Dr. Lee's work, which is about protein-protein interactions as they exist in the, the host pathogen setting, I think is super important as potentially, you know, these new things that could be themselves targeted. Um, and so I think there's a, a tremendous scope for therapeutic development. So that question made me kind of think about how this appears in other fields like uh, like cancer, where those interactions are obviously within a single person, um, not between a pathogen and the person. So, so this is a great question. And I mean, I just wanted to kind of point out that there's a lot of work kind of just starting to be done in this, in this area. So, so that, yeah, it's very exciting actually. It Thanks. really is, it really is. And if I could take that a little farther, um, what I've been thinking about since COVID started is what if there was a silver lining that some of the work we do with COVID and the learnings we get can actually be applied for virus related cancers, whether it's therapeutics or if it's the mRNA, 
you know, what are their ways? And what I'm really um, excited about is I've been reading more NIH, NCI, and FDA material where they're saying the same thing, that researchers and doctors are looking at that, which it would be nice if there was an unexpected silver lining um, to this terrible pandemic that we're going through. Um, but I'd be interested in thoughts about that. You know, as we look at the conference, the annual conference that we want to do besides our monthly kick webinars, I'm wondering if that would be an interesting workshop as part of the conference is looking at, you know, COVID and cancer related opportunities for the future, which sounds like an opportunity of out of two terrible things, but sometimes that happens. Are there any comments about that if we think that would be a valuable discussion or workshop? I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay. And, mm -hmm. and um, I would love to see something like that. And I think actually that the, the synergy could even go beyond the viral cancers. Now we, we, you know, and it'd be nice to have it spill back from the cancer world where we do have some traction, particularly things like the HPV related cancers um, where there's, you know, very effective vaccination uh, that, that makes a huge difference for development of those cancers. Um, but, but I think that, you know, the, the, the potential for kind of cross learning and I would add into that mix, by the way, immunotherapy stuff and the, mm -hmm. the big push now for immunotherapies for cancer. Um, you know, I think there's incredible scope. And I would, uh, since I have a, a footprint in both worlds, I would really love to see something like that come mm -hmm. along in, in the meeting. So maybe we could cook that up together, Miranda, and bring, <laughs> bring the family in. <laughs> count me in, count me in. That sounds great. I'm fortunate that I've been working with NCI. I've, I've been on the program committee for their computational approaches for cancer workshop that we do at the supercomputing conference every year. And you're you're involved in that too, aren't you? I have been peripherally and and I not not right. nearly as much I as I'd like to. Um, yeah. Because uh, there that's a great community and and so yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of cross potential for cross fertilization. You know, there is, and the whole community has been getting better at cross fertilization. I'll be honest, like in our first workshop, I think we just had the seventh one maybe, we had the DOE people who were like real algorithmists. They've been working with large hadron collider, you know, large hadron collider data and all sorts of stuff. And then we had the NCI medical people and we had them present together and they were looking at each other like, what are you talking about? You know, because they were really, it was like a Tower of Babel moment. But over the years, there's, it's so integrative now, the research and the discussions going on. So there's been very nice integration, um, you know, it, already uh, with NCI reaching out to different groups. And so I think this could be really fascinating. Um, so I'm really glad that you hopped in. And it's been a dream of mine that I've been quiet about since I thought, I didn't know if anybody was ready, <laughs> but it seems like they are now. So I'm excited. This is one of those opportunities that comes up because of, you know, the, the very difficult circumstances, you know, if it, if it breeds some, some great and fruitful collaborations, that's, that's, a, you know, at least something good that comes out of it. That's what I'm hoping for. Let's join the Optimist Club. Um, Franz, I actually have a question um, for you. You know, I, I do a fair amount of work in this area that we're calling TIPS with IEEE, which stands for Trust identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security. We kind of coined that in 2016, and now I lead a global working group on clinical Internet of Things and tips and stuff like that and data and device interoperability. And in the privacy and the trust and identity perspective, you know, privacy and trust go hand in hand sometimes, right? And trust is, um, because of some of the privacy issues of over the past, I don't know, handful of years uh, that we've all seen around the planet, um, you know, trust has, uh, the issues of trust related to privacy are growing. And so I kept seeing that, you know, in what you were presenting. And I'm wondering if there's anything um, further you want to share on that, um, where you think that's going, if there's um, more of an opportunity to work more broadly or deeply with other groups in that area. Because um, I, I kept, it was like a song I kept hearing as you were talking. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share some of your thoughts on the trust and privacy implications. So um, yeah, trust is an issue, but I'm gonna take it one step behind that and it's knowledge. And so, you know, I study people and I study privacy and I've done this for a long time and trust. Mm -hmm. And People trust on basis that they don't understand. And people also 
worry about privacy or not on basis that they don't understand. We have done everything mm-hmm. from giving them, um, you know, we built tools to help people learn about how to set their settings on their smartphone and people still won't do that. And so in, so I'm also in the cybersecurity world, but from a governance standpoint. So in cybersecurity, we're moving to zero trust because, because you don't know who to trust. And even if you trust, you don't really know that you should trust the information that's coming through. We're talking about intelligence in the cybersecurity world, but it's the same thing with privacy. And so until we solve the problem of people understanding what the technologies do, how the information is shared, how it's used. I mean, we all know Facebook's the best example. I I never do Facebook research because it's too everywhere, Um, but, or meta, I should call it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's so, I've been really trying to figure out how are we going to get society to understand what's going on in both the privacy, the trust, um, and the security, basically. So, mm-hmm. so those are the three pillars we're actually putting together. So, um, so, so to, I'm not really answering your question because I'm not starting with trust. I'm starting with the step before it, which Knowledge. people need to understand it. And they don't really understand what technology does. They don't know that uh, Jingzi is measuring what they're searching on the web uh, in which city in Wikipedia or things like that. I and mean, I'm talking about society in general. We are in a privileged group here mm-hmm. and we understand a lot more and more and more aware, but that's not true out there. Um, and so, so I think that's where I would like to start is to find a way to provide that educational aspect. You know, we call it education, training, and awareness, but how do we get society to really understand what is happening with the technology and in terms of the information? It's all about information flow, which information is going where. And so um, so before, so, so trust is based often on a, lack of understanding and lack of trust is also based on the lack of understanding of the technology. So I think we need a lot there. And, you know, we say in security, remove the human, right? We all know we have to use strong password. We didn't want to do that. And suddenly our work organization said, well, you can't log in if you don't use a strong password. So we took the ability, the human, out of it by automating. So I'm hearing this wonderful conversations about trying to find solutions medically. And I think that it's gonna be very important because if we rely on, and this was our, one of the things from our study, if we rely on the humans to do the right thing from a technology perspective that they don't understand, it's not gonna happen. And so we need the solutions to come from either policy or, the medical field as we're hearing today. Very interesting. So one of the things we're doing in the clinical IoT space, working with IEEE and Underwriters Laboratories, uh, um, for instance, is we're taking the IAM land, the Identity and Access Management land, and T and I trust my identity. And it's currently at the human level, as you said. Now what we're doing is trying to apply it to the device level in a defense in depth strategy, which is really, you know, you're, you know, nobody's really looked at it that way before. So that's what we're trying to do in the standards effort. And so, you know, what you're making me think is how that would apply to the discussion we're having today. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And, and it's device to device, trust identity access management, device to human, human to human, human to device. It's the whole, the whole ecosystem. And I haven't thought through it all the way um, through like, you know, Jingji, what you're, what you're doing and all the data you're bringing together, um, you know, and Dr. Lee, the information you're bringing together in France, you know, you come from this expertise area. It, it, you know, I think it's an interesting thing for us to think about. And if we want to talk about that further, I'd be um, happy to, you know, come up with another way for us to communicate on this and talk about it together. I actually also had a question for a friend. So Thanks for sharing your research on the COVID-19 tracking apps and the perception of teens and parent groups. I was also wondering if you looked at a separate senior group that could be like the grandparents of the teens and if there are any differences compared to the teen and the parent groups. And also in addition, could there be any changes in the privacy result and the family connectedness? Because even though they've had less 
exposure to the technology, they also couldn't meet their children and grandparents if they're in nursing homes. So if you could just provide some um, info on that, that'd be great. So we do have a age graph that shows that the older adults and um, I'm pulling it right now, but the older adults um, definitely were left not you know, having any understanding in anything. We have a separate study where we do have grandparents and children, but it's an interview based. And when faced with COVID, they actually got closer. So that connectedness actually was very high. And this was interview based, a completely different study. Um, in this particular study, we only had dyads. So we had one parent and all we have is some parents are very old and some parents are younger, but we don't actually have different kinds of dyads with older adults. But yes, that would be very fascinating. If I can just add one thing, you're bringing up a point that is very important. Um, and it goes back to, the, I mentioned digital divide and old terminology. We call it inclusion today. We call all these new te um, terminology, but the digital divide, basically as it was known 10, 15 years ago is still there. Um, and it concerns me because it's not just about, it's about understanding everything we've talked about today. So, um, so yeah, that's a very good point, but no, we don't actually have that data in this particular study. Okay, yeah, no problem. I think it's interesting how you said in the other study, how there was more family connectedness in some groups. So thanks for sharing. Thank you very much. And I just like to mention that Aditya is actually a high school senior now. And last year when he was a junior, he won third place in the COVID Information, Colin, uh, COVID Information Commons undergraduate challenge, because he's also been taking math classes at the University of Minnesota for a few years. So he is one of the leaders that we're all going to follow someday. <laughs> so so um, it's wonderful how he's so engaged with our community. Thank you so much, as always, Aditya, for sharing your thoughts and questions and answers with us. Yep, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Of course, it's great to have you here. So, um, you know, I want to bring up a, a thought. Um, one of the things we've talked about on and off is this digital divide, as you mentioned, Fonce. And, um, you know, and also interestingly, the way you talked about, I think what I just heard is that teens and grandparents qualitatively, you know, got closer during this. Very interesting, right? One of the things we've talked about on and off is having like digital Sherpas for some of the, you know, the, the people who aren't as digitally competent or confident or whatever, um, kind of like the candy stripers of old, <laughs> but they would be like digital and they would help in some of these, you know, medical or other environments. And I would love to put in a proposal to someone uh, to say that we want to create a community like that. Uh, but ha have you thought about some of the ways to leverage the insight you've already gleaned um, to try to address that digital divide? And I was wondering if you have, if there are any thoughts you have on that? I, I don't have a solution, um, unfortunately. I'm also involved with the Center for Gerontology and we're trying to address these issues. So we did studies of privacy with older adults. Um, the only thing I'll say is everybody says, well, just wait. 20 years and you know everybody will be technology aware and it won't have a digital divide anymore and it's not true because it's just going to be different technology and i don't know how many of you had a university where you had to use a health app but we it was mandated for us back in i think march or april 2020 and i went and read the privacy policy nobody does that of course um and they were actually going to share my information. So I, I went to bat with my university about what was in there. How many people are going to do that? So for an older adult, I agree. It, it, somebody needs to stand up and make it happen. And maybe the family is the right unit for this to happen. You know, the young sharing their knowledge, but then we get into power dynamics. And so, yeah. you know, when you share information and knowledge, you, you let a little bit of your power go away. So I'm not sure how you get the younger generation to do that. Yeah, there's so much to think through. You're absolutely right. I'm thinking of like, you know, power of attorney, healthcare proxy, digital healthcare, pro you know, so there are so many things to consider technology and policy wise, uh, but it would be interesting to try to figure out 
some solutions and, you know, do a pilot test case. And, you know, it could be a, you know, a volunteer core, you know, who knows what, you know, it is. And maybe, you know, it's kind of like, you know, NSF rules of engagement, like, you know, if you're related to this person, you can't be on the panel, <laughs> you know, or something like that. So, you know, so it actually takes some of the power play within the family out of it. I don't know, that's very complicated, but life is getting more complicated. Um, so, you know, complex problems is what we all live for, I think, in different ways. So, I um, mean, how we address them. So I think that's a, an interesting topic. If anyone ever wants to talk about that, I'd to I still have this picture of my girlfriend, one of my friends is a candy striper when, when we were younger, you know, and uh, they would hand out books back then. And I'm like, oh, why don't you help them with their digital technology now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what they need. Yeah, digital Sherpas, great. Yeah, I do too, France. You know, it's just a thought we've had, you know, so let's see, it, it can morph. It doesn't have to be the right answer, but I think it gets us into a new thinking space that maybe can get us to a better answer. So thank you. Excellent. Are there any other comments or, or questions anybody wants to share? Any needs that you know you would like the COVID Info Commons team to help you with? Okay, great. Obligatory five seconds. Well, um, you all did a wonderful job engaging. We really want to thank our panelists. Um, for all your presentations, Jingji. We're so delighted you were able to join us as a fourth year PhD student. It's great. You're our future too. Aditi is just a little bit behind you, at least, I don't know, maybe not for long. You never know. Watch out. Um, and so please stay tuned. We'll be having another one of these every month. Um, and then we're going to start planning our conference for later in the year, our student paper challenge, our next student paper challenge. Aditi can consult with us on that since he's participated before, perhaps. Um, and we're going to be looking at some of these thematic discussions and workshops. So continue to give us your feedback. We really appreciate it. Uh, we always say if we follow you, you'll follow us, you know, because we're giving you something of value. So we do want to follow you. And we want to thank Kenya again for joining our team and welcome her and uh, Lauren and Haley and Emily um, on our team as well. So everyone be safe, be well, and uh, we hope to chat soon. Anything else, Lauren, our master of ceremony? You got everything, Florence. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Great job, everybody. Thank you very much and stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.